Hi everyone. Um, I think our attendee members seem to have numbers seem to have leveled off for a bit. So, um, welcome to breaking into peace and security: where and how to look. Um, we'll get started. So, this event is being hosted by the Forming the Future Working Group of the Orgs in Solidarity Initiative. Um, if you don't know about either of those things, Orgs in Solidarity is a project to involve people from across the peace and security sector. Um, in opposing racism and promoting diversity and inclusion. Um, and Forming the Future helps to showcase the ideas and needs of early career professionals within Orgs in Solidarity. Um, forming uh, Where and How to Look is the second event in our series. And today our three speakers will provide advice on how to search for positions in the peace and security sector. Um, if you missed our previous event, Intro to Early Career Roles, discussing what types of positions exist, for people starting work in peace and security. A recording is on the Orson Solidarity YouTube channel. Um, we hope that you all find today's webinar helpful, that we'll see you again at the rest of the events in our series. And of course, that if you're searching for a job, you're able to be successful. Um, to begin today's event, I'm going to introduce all of our panelists, um, Edith, Andrea, and Mahar. Ask a few poll questions of the audience so we have a better idea of what you might be looking for in this webinar. Um, and then I'll move into prepared questions for the panelists before opening it up to questions from anyone in the audience. Um, so first, Edith Carduni, um, Edith, if you want to wave, um, is the Director of Human Resources and Talent Management at Partners Global, a DC-based international development NGO that focuses on peace building, conflict transformation, and democracy building. She's a certified senior human resources professional whose career began in the nonprofit legal services sector where she supported labor and employment litigation for immigrant and migrant farm worker communities in rural South Texas. Her areas of expertise include DEI strategy, employee engagement, talent acquisition, talent management, rewards and recognition, and performance engagement and organizational development. Thank you for speaking with us today, Edith. Um, Andrea Pimentel is originally from Maracaibo, um, Venezuela, and grew up in Western Florida. She started as an intern at Women's Action for New Directions in the summer of 2019 and joined as a program coordinator that fall. Since its inception, Andrea has helped grow the Envos Alta Peace and Security Mentor Program, in addition to managing a rotation of communication, administrative, and advocacy projects. Prior to joining WAND, Andrea interned for Mercy Corps' policy and advocacy team and completed a legislative internship in the US House of Representatives. Venezuela's political landscape and ongoing humanitarian crisis sparked her interest in international relations growing up. Um, and she's committed to studying and working to advance peace and security at home and abroad through her work and welcoming new voices to the field. Andrea, thank you for joining us today. Um, and finally, Mahar Akrami is the Program Direct Manager at WCAPS, Women of Color Advancing Peace and Security, focusing on the development and implementation of the organizations in Solidarity Project. His role includes managing membership, facilitating meetings and events, and designing and managing the website. Prior to WCAPS, Mahar was the Fall 2019 Herbert Scoville Junior Peace Fellow at the Alliance for Peacebuilding. He graduated in 2018 from Lincoln University in Jefferson City, Missouri, where he studied political science as well as history, philosophy, and English. Thank you for being here today, Maher. Um, so thank you again to all of our wonderful panelists for giving us their time. We're very much looking forward to your advice on approaching a job search in the peace and security sector. Um, to the audience, um, my assistant chair will now make away available the first of our poll questions. Um, so this one is just asking if you identify as a person of color. Um, and in, if we want to, if you want to fill out this one for 30 seconds, and then I think we should have another one soon. Um, so these are of course optional and we can't see who submitted what answers, but seeing where people are coming from will be really helpful to the panelists for targeting their responses and forming the future for as a whole for seeing who our events are reaching. Um, so um, Katie, if you now want to put up the second poll question. Um, 
So the second poll question is whether you or not you're currently searching for a job. Um, so this could just help us have an idea of whether how immediately you'd want the advice in our webinar. Um, so now I'll begin asking, as I said, the previously prepared questions. Um, but while we're doing this, um, if you're in the audience, feel free to add your questions to using the Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom window. And afterwards, our panelists will answer them. Okay, so um, for our first question um, is directed towards Andrea and Maher, both for yourselves and your mentees. What strategies have you found most successful for getting a job in the peace and security field? Um, Andrea, would you like to start answering? Sure, yeah, thank you so much, Amelia. Uh, so this is gonna sound complicated, but it's really not meant to be, <laughs> but I kind of have like a three-pronged approach that I've seen helps people and then applied at times myself, but it's just a way to help you get organized and make sense of the pro process and help you feel like you're making progress. So I'd really focus on researching resources that are readily available, focusing on people and then attending events. So when I say researching resources, I think of with every passing day, there's more fellowships and scholarships and mentor programs and initiatives that are being created and already exist. So I would recommend you know, spending a little bit of time starting an Excel sheet and just starting to look up all of the resources that are available to you that you can tap into and will make the process easier because they will expose you to both people and opportunities that you may not have known about prior. Um, when I say people, I mean LinkedIn. If you, you know, I would really utilize LinkedIn and sending out a message. People are really you know, wonderful about volunteering 20 or so minutes of their time. So just reaching out to ask about uh, an informational interview and just whether it's a Zoom chat or a phone call and like really focus on people that you are genuinely interested in. Maybe that you have something in common. So you went to the same university, you interned in the same place, whatever it may be, use that as kind of a a hook to show that they can also help you because they want to make sure that they feel good about the time that they're spending and that they can genuinely support you um, in your conversation. So it feels great, build support systems and, and exposes you to new people and, and opportunities. And the more people you have in your corner, the better. And then events, it's harder now because we're online, uh, but do your best as I guess the world starts to open up and even virtual events, it helps to make yourself visible. Um, familiarize yourself with different organizations in the space that you're looking for, their work, and also keeps you learning, keeps you on your toes of the reports they're releasing or you know how they're bringing organizations together in their space. Uh, so for those that have a pen, and I'm, I'm about wrapping up this first one so I can pass it on to Mar, but, um, WCAPS is the perfect resource that I would recommend. It's one of the best listservs I've ever seen. People are constantly sharing opportunities and volunteering advice. Um, so seek out for those listservs. CSIS Trinity Fellowship is a new program, relatively new program, and I believe it's going into a second year that started out and is bringing in new voices and it's really robust program. And beside that, if you're interested at WANS, certainly reach out Scoville is fantastic. One of my dear friends participated in Scoville. Girl Security, there's plenty of, of organizations that are that are here and are looking for to get more people involved. Um, and then I'm going to give a quick shout out to the OSCE, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, who has trainings and classes in place for young professionals interested in conflict prevention and arms control and nonproliferation. I just finished a summer training and they're great. So seek out those resources and opportunities and bring in people along the way to, to help you feel better and make it a little bit easier. So that, that's my, my quick advice on that. Great, thank you, Andrea. I think some people have started to write in the chat links to some of these websites. So if there were any that you mentioned and you wanted to add, um, that would be very helpful. Maher, did you have anything to add? Yeah, yeah. So Andrea was very, very thorough, but I, I think I can, I can sort of 
add in just little little nuggets here and there. Um, spreadsheet, I second that. Um, I found that creating a list of organizations I was interested in the work of was sometimes the most powerful tool I could build. Not even it, organizations that have open positions, but organizations that I could check back in with in a month, in two months. Thinking about searching for a job as a job often helps because it is, it takes that much time oftentimes. And it, you kind of have to think about it that way and approach it that way for your psychological health, in my opinion, and for the longevity of the effect of your approach. So creating a list of organizations you're interested in. And when I say interested, I don't necessarily mean like this is an organization in the field. I mean, like one that you look through, you agree with the uh, mission and vision of it would be a place you'd want to work and importantly go to Glassdoor and make sure it's not a nightmare organization to work at if you could happen to or if you remember if you're a person of color especially if you're a member of W Caps or a place like that you could send out a message to the uh, listserv and say hey does anyone know x organization that could we could have a conversation about it because it's pretty important to find work at a place that isn't going to make your life difficult and it's another layer for people of color that is like not much fun to have to deal with, but it is a reality. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my suggestion. Make a list of organizations that you would like to work for and you know enough about to say, this is a place I could live with working at. Um, so that's, that's one piece of advice I have on that front. And people are really important. Informational interviews are great. I tend to approach those not so much as a, how can this person help me get a job, but more as a, this person does work I'm extremely interested in. I want to have a conversation. It makes it feel less transactional. And I think that brings something really genuine. But to be clear, I'm not saying Andrea was suggesting a transactional interaction because I don't think she was, but I'm just pin it, putting a pin in that because I think that makes for a really genuine connection with people. And the fact is you got to be comfortable with being uncomfortable because some of those are going to be awkward and that's just the way it goes. Um, and some of them are going to be amazing. Um, yeah, Scoville, I am a former Scoville fellow, as was mentioned, that's an amazing network and it is I think maybe the best doorway into peace and security for someone coming from outside of DC that I have seen. So if you're interested in applying there, um, I'll put my LinkedIn in the chat. Feel free to reach out. I'm pretty swamped, so I can't guarantee I'll get back to you immediately, but I will get back to you because that I think is a really, really useful, useful place to, to look. Um, and I'll toot my own horn a little bit. Org Solidarity has a job board as well that's dedicated to trying to make connections between people of color specifically in the field or who want to be in the field and organizations who have openings, trying to sort of eliminate that, that uh, old truism that they don't know where to find people of color for these positions. We're, we're trying to work against that. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll end it there because honestly, Andrea's answer was really, really thorough. I just have a couple of more points I can add. Great, that's really helpful. Um, so Edith, you're coming from a slightly different background. So from your perspective, where do you think are the best places to find job postings and position openings in the peace and security field? And are there any specific keywords applicants should pay special attention to in their search? Yeah, so I just wanted to give a shout out to Maher and Andrea for um, their approaches to job searches, because I will say there are plenty of job boards that you can look at that will have vacancies. DevX is a great website, uh, PDCN, Society for International Development. Those are sort of the big powerhouses where you'll find a list of openings. The reality is those job boards are flooded with applicants. Um, and a lot of how recruiting is done is there are um, specific keywords in a resume um, that get flagged. And so there isn't an individual person really looking at your resume in smaller organizations like mine. I look through every person's resume, but in these larger bureaucratic organizations, I'm talking about like the creatives and the chemonics of the world. There isn't anybody there that's going to be looking for um, skill sets that maybe don't come through as well in your resume. It is really a transactional process. So I'd say the best way to look for jobs is to do exactly what um, my other panelists have recommended, make a list of 
you know, 10 to 20 organizations that you are truly interested in, meaning you have researched the work that they do, you are really familiar with it, you know the projects in and out, you know the news that's coming out of that organization, you've studied the composition of the leadership. Um, this is particularly important for my fellow people of color. Um, look at the leadership. Does it look like you? Does it reflect you? Are there women, um, for some of my women out there, are there women in leadership positions? All that matters. Look at their core values. Do they align with yours? Look at class door ratings. Um, but even beyond that, I would be, once you make your list of 10 to 20 organizations that you're really interested in, and again, that interest level is going to depend on you as an individual, I would reach out directly to people who are doing the work. Don't automatically go to the HR leader. And I'll tell you why. One, we get thousands of emails a day, no joke, from people who are like you, want to break into the field. And it's very transactional. They really want to know what can I do for them. The people that I'm really interested in are the ones that have reached out to my colleagues who are actually doing the work. For example, if you want to work in international development and you have a particular area of interest in the Middle East and North Africa, if you reach out to a member of my team there and then they forward me a resume, my interest is piqued. I'm very much willing to have an additional informational conversation with someone. Um, so that's what I would say would be best. Again, all of these job boards will get picked up again and again. So if, you, if something's posted on DevX, it's gonna go through Glassdoor and Indeed. I think LinkedIn is an amazing resource. Um, so what I would do first is follow the in organizations that you're interested in on LinkedIn um, because you'll get alerts of jobs that are available. You'll get to see who works there. Um, if there's a particular position that you're interested in, I would look at someone who's previously held that role and going beyond the glass door ratings. Um, I would reach out to that person and ask about their experience. Um, some people are really forthcoming with information and other people will be really cagey. That's a huge red flag for you um, if someone is scared to talk about the organizational culture. Um, I know we don't say this enough because it's about breaking into the sector, but you are interviewing the organization just as much as they are interviewing you. Um, and I would say what's really important for early professionals is you want your first experience to be a good one. Otherwise, you will be forever emotionally scarred from your experience. So I would say more than anything, breaking in, yes, it's very important, but make sure it's a good culture fit for you and make sure that you have a seat at the table and that you feel like you belong there. Um, and you won't get all that information up front in a job description, so you're gonna have to do the work. So I would say first things first, focus less on the keyword searches like you know one to two years of experience because sometimes, um, organizations will say one to two years of experience and ultimately what they really want is three to five. I would really focus on the organizations that you're interested in and then tap into the networks um, that you have. Um, very similar to what Andrea said about, um, you know, looking at the work that people are doing. Do you have any connections to them? Like how can you tap your existing network? It's a small world, the sector is really small. So somebody probably knows an individual that can get your foot in the door. Um, and so it's about not only asking information about current or future vacancies, but really, are you volunteering your time? Are you interested in getting to know them? Um, I think that's another way to get your foot in the door. Okay, I'm done. That was very long-winded. That was great because I think you've already started touching on what we were going to ask about next, which was um, during the application and interview process, how do you determine whether a job will be right for you? and particularly whether the organization will be committed to the professional development of people of color. Um, but I'm sure that our other panelists also have great contributions to this question. So um, Andrea, do, do you have anything to say about this? I believe Edith touched on it earlier and I was gonna say, look at leadership, uh, look at people's trajectories. Is the organization investing in retaining its diverse workforce? Um, so I think that's becoming more and more common nowadays. So definitely look for that. Look at new programming initiatives. Are they making changes? Are you seeing, are you seeing those changes you know, over the years um, that they're investing in, in these new initiatives and new programs um, and staff retainment? And then um, 
negotiate for investments in your professional development. I, I've i certainly heard talks about this and just like you can negotiate a salary, you can negotiate leave and other things, maybe consider adding that to your next raise or promotion conversation and, and, and asking for, for resources to invest in yourself, making that a part of your, of your job and your growth. Maher, I know you also already started talking a bit about choosing organizations that um, you care about. Um, is there anything else that you would want to say? Yeah, yeah. So just reiterating that, you know, if you're looking at an organization and you're wondering, track down someone who worked there, especially a person of color. Most times, if you come to them with that question, they'll be pretty straightforward. And as you get said, if they aren't straightforward, that's a problem. Um, Outside of that, if you do get an interview, I cannot underline how much chemistry matters. First of all, if you're being interviewed by the people you'd be working with, if you do not have a good connection in that interview, if it feels off, there's probably something to that. That isn't necessarily a statement that like, don't go further with it, but be aware of it, be conscious of it, take it as a piece of evidence along with all the other evidence you're already gathering about the organization, because that does matter. It might be that they're just bad at interviewing. It happens, but it also might be that it would be a bad organization to work for or bad people to work with because maybe they aren't really cognizant of these issues and aren't really taking steps because who knows? Who knows? But that is something to keep in mind. Generally trust your instincts on that, which again, isn't to say end it right there, but it is something that is a part of that calculus and trust your instincts. Um, Outside of that, yeah, no, I think I really touched on most of this. As far as searching, it, it can be hard and it can see it can feel like a lot of work, which I'll hopefully get to touch on later. But um, yeah, just reach out to people you know, reach out to people who work there, get a feel for it if you can. Um, and to be clear, not every job application is created equal, right? We have all, well, I don't know very many people who haven't done a job to pay bills. There is not a thing wrong with that, to be completely clear. If you're applying to five jobs in a week and one of them is, if I get this, I can pay my bills, that's not a problem. And I think that's an important thing to acknowledge and underline. Um, yeah, I just wanted to, yeah. So some jobs, maybe you aren't gonna be putting every one of these steps into place because Maybe that's a job you could get, you could live with, you could pay your bills from, and then build forward to something else that you really want to do. There's value in that too. Great. Um, I think our next question was going to be um, about connections and informational interviews, which I think people have also started mentioning. Um, but how do connections, networking, and informational interviews factor into the job application process itself? Um, maybe Edith, if you want to start. Yeah, so I'm going to approach it from an HR perspective and give you like the compliance component. Um, so networks are great. We love referrals, um, but it is illegal in the interviewing and recruitment process to give a backdoor reference. What does that mean? Um, someone's interested in us. We don't really know anything about them. So we ask someone who's connected them the story. Um, they tell us something that maybe is less savory or unfavorable, and then we decide to totally drop that candidate. That is super illegal. Um, so heads up, some people and some organizations will automatically not want to have a ton of involvement with um, referrals or asking for questions. So be very careful of what you're asking. If you're just asking for an introduction, I think that's totally different. Um, so that's the HR hat on. I think the referrals and the networks go a long way, especially if someone's willing to put themselves out there. Every time that you're asking for an introduction, the person that's making the connection is sticking their neck out for you. I've had in other organizations, someone reach out to me with the referral and it ended up being a total bust, meaning that person um, did not perform, kind of ghosted people on the job, was not collaborative. And so as a result, it really burnt a bridge with that professional network. So be really careful about what you're asking. And if you're asking for someone to put their name on the line, um, it's time to show up and show them what you've got. Um, and I say that particularly for 
um, folks who are asking to be introduced, especially by other people of color. Um, so I just want to say it is really uncomfortable um, out there in the world, like diversity and inclusion and belonging is a brand new concept, even from an HR perspective. And so anytime that I'm putting my name out, if it comes back and haunts me in any way, I take that very personally, um, because I feel like as a woman of color, I've had to work a thousand times harder than some of my um, colleagues um, who are not people of color. So there's that piece, but I do think it's really important if it is um, something that you believe in, the organizational mission, and that it's not transactional, that you're really just interested in learning more to help you and aid in your decision. And oftentimes I've conducted informational interviews where someone's decided, you know what, Partners Global just isn't for me. I want something a little bit bigger. I choose to be working kind of in country or based in DC. That is totally okay too. Um, but what I've really valued is those informational conversations. Those people have kept in touch. Um, they tell me what's going on in their lives. They've reached out to me on LinkedIn and congratulated me. Like that's really important. So don't just have a one-time informational meeting and then ghost them because let me tell you this sector this world is so small and people will remember that so try to make sure that if you're having these informational conversations even if it doesn't work out it's not for you um, part of what makes external networking so successful is actually utilizing it and tapping into that network I mean, you don't need to bombard people with emails every day, but if something really cool is happening to you, for example, you're finishing a graduate program and you wanted to check in, like that's news that I really love to hear. Um, I have also had people that ultimately didn't come to our organization that shared, hey, I, I got a great job with the UN in Sudan. Um, and it's because you encouraged me to look for other jobs. Like that's information that I love. And then as a result, those people end up being and a sort of bridge for someone else. So they'll connect me to other referrals. So you see, it's sort of like a cycle that happens. Um, I know that's very complex, but I just wanted to throw it out there. I'll hand it over to anyone else who wants to join. I think I saw your hand. I don't know if Andrew might Yeah, um, but to speak to the, so connections, networking and informational interviews are in my opinion, very important to finding a job. Um, I would characterize them as probably as important as applying to jobs, which feels weird, but I'll tell you why. Um, I think that they're more important for finding out where to look, finding out what to look for, finding out a position that is gonna come out next week is gonna come out next week. So you could be at the top of the pile when you're applying. like knowing information that isn't free, like secret information, like it's not secret, it's just you now have someone who knows you're looking so they could, you know, help. That's really what a network is for. It's people who apparently think you're a valuable person and are willing to help you. That is really important because I can tell you that I wouldn't be where I am now without a network, without having reached out to a network of people. I, I was unemployed for a while in 2020, which is, wasn't a great time to be unemployed. Not that there's any good time to be unemployed, but the reason I am where I am is because I reached out to people in my network. I talked to them and a job came up and they were like, I think this would be really good for you. You should apply. And then I did. And here we are. So it really is important, not necessarily to get a leg up at an organization, but to actually know that there's even a door to try and get through. Um, yeah, because I, I and, and beyond that, networking can be really, really good for, and, and informational interviews can be really, really good for your soul while you're searching for a job. Having a conversation with someone who's doing really, really interesting work that you are interested in can be a really solid panacea for staring down three months of searching for a job, four months of searching for a job, that existential dread that creeps in. It can be a really good panacea for that because you can suddenly see like, there is something here. That is a thing I could do. There, there are ways to get here. Everybody has a story about how they got to where they are and it almost never makes any sense or it's a straight line. Like the fact is that there are jags and 
weird corners and a job you lost and you were unemployed for a while and then you went to Europe. Like everybody's story is weird and informational interviews are really, really valuable for that piece too. Your experience is unique to you, but there are experiences like it all over the place, even people who are extremely successful now. That helped me a lot. Um, and uh, yeah, so that I would say it's important for those two things. And also, you know, maybe you know someone who can then put you in contact with someone at the organization who can then refer you, like Edith said. Like, yeah, so important, probably equally important, but also that piece of it is much more personal and it can be very, very beneficial outside of finding that job. Andrea, would you like to add your perspective as well? Yes, honestly, such amazing advice and input. Like I wanted to tap into this years ago, um, but so good for the soul. I agree, it can get pretty draining to not hear back and constantly be sending cover letters and applications and feeling like it's going into dark voids. So those conversations I feel are good for the soul, good for learning, good for meeting people. So yes, echoing all of that. And then also don't underestimate the value of your peer networks. I feel like a lot of times when we talk about mentorship and when you're applying a job, you're looking for the senior person or you want to talk to someone higher in the ranks. And, and sometimes it's really people that are closer to your position or whatever phase you're in that maybe you're a year ahead, a year behind, but you don't know. The world is very small. People move quickly um, and have very valuable things to share and, so, and can have very relevant experiences. So while someone senior we absolutely welcome the advice and the perspective and, and it's incredibly valuable, but also somebody that's closer to your age and your current phase of life and career can have just gone through the fellowship that you are now going to apply to in the following cycle, can have just met somebody that helped them. So you just, it, it, they're much more recent to the, to the phase of, of career that you're in. So I'd say don't underestimate that as well. Great, um, thank you. Sorry, Amelia, just to touch on the emotional labor of applying for jobs. I know getting those rejection emails, those canned rejection emails are a gut punch every single time. Um, so I would say, you know, again, the recruitment process, a lot of it is automated these days. Um, so there isn't really anybody having sent. Um, it's just a, a process. And so I would say, don't take it personal. Um, and then the other piece of advice that I would have, um, I know a lot of folks that get rejection emails after they've interviewed ask for advice, but there are actual legal reasons why most HR leaders or hiring managers won't actually sit down and give you feedback. Um, so don't take that personal either. But I would say if you're getting a ton of rejection notices, take a look at the documents that you're submitting. I've found that probably 90% of the time, there are some major grammatical issues. You're sending cover letters with the wrong organization attached, right? And so when you're a hiring manager looking, which happens, hey, we're all human, right? I've done it in my career, I'm sure. Um, but when you're looking for a position um, and one of the key priorities or core competencies is attention to detail, right? That's going to be a ding right there. So if you're getting a ton of rejections and you're not necessarily sure why, take a look at your resume, take a look at your cover letter. Your cover letter should be tailored to the organization, first of all. Um, and then I will offer up to anybody who's on this presentation, if you need an HRI to take a look at the documents that you're submitting, reach out to me on LinkedIn. I'll take a peek and I'm pretty sure that we can help figure out what's not working. The other thing too, is if you're submitting a cover letter that's 50 pages long, no one's reading it. If your resume is more than a page long, we're skimming through it. Um, so it's about really making sure that what the information that you are presenting is really concise and really to the point. And again, you should have, nobody's gonna like to hear this. You should have multiple resumes tailored to different organizations. It's a lot of extra work, but I guarantee you, 
If you do that, you will have much more success in the long run and getting a foot in the door and actually passing the interview stage off soapbox. Um, and I'll just add to that. Um, this is why you kind of have to treat looking for a job as a job because you have to prioritize these things because it's the work that's required. I think I'll have the opportunity to talk a little later about how to let yourself be free of that at other times in your day. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is hiring, I've been on both sides a bit. It's miserable for everyone because it's it's just, it's a weird process that has to happen. So giving a little grace to everyone on every side, I, I found makes my life easier because I'm not thinking that the person who reviewed my application or didn't is a bad person. They're a swamped person and they're making it work. Um, yeah. That means a lot, Maher. As a person who's usually on the other side giving bad news, thank you. We are humans too. Although not always reviewing, but you know. Um, so I did have, we did have several more questions prepared um, about mentorship and time management. But I think that since those have been touched on a little bit, if people have more questions, they could about time management and mentorship, they could put them in the Q&A box. Um, so I'll just ask Edith about transferable skills and then we'll move on to the Q&A questions because I do want to get time for all of the things you've been asking. Um, so Edith, um, how would you uh, advise job applicants to present transferable skills when they don't maybe have a background in peace and security and they're applying to this sector? Yeah, um, so that's a great question. I feel like, um, so just for reference, I came from the for-profit space with some legal services. So I am not an international development peace and security expert. Um, and so in HR, it's a little bit different. You don't necessarily need to be a subject matter expert in the organization that you're in. You need to know enough to be dangerous, but I am not the technical expert. I would say the people that have been really successful um, we call them non-traditional candidates. There's not a really good way to phrase that, but essentially um, this goes back to the organizations that you've hopefully researched and are applying for. Um, look at people's bios and the organizations and see where they've come up. Um, we at Partners Global, something that's really important to me as it relates to diversity, inclusion, and belonging is around when you hire people that have only ever been in this sector, that have only ever done this work, that go to the same universities, that all, I mean, you name it, they're exactly the same, meaning the profile of the candidate is identical. And the challenge there ties to diversity of thought. If everyone's from the same background is not really any different, right? How do you come up with creative solutions for complex problems? So I love, 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 love a non-traditional candidate, but, the question is, how do I break in when I don't have this experience? One, again, you're hopefully doing your research on the organization and you know the different projects that they're working on, the different priorities, and you can really talk to it. Um, the other thing that will come up in the interviewing questions um, is, okay, here's the requisite experience. You seem to lack X, Y, and Z. I'm going to ask a candidate, so tell me, you're new to the sector. How are you going to come up to speed um, in the next, you know, 30, 60, 90 days, what's your plan? What are some of the trainings that you're invested in? Um, I also like to see candidates that have done their homework reviewing job descriptions and, and are honest about their lack of experience saying, hey, you know what? I don't really have the budget management experience that's required, but you know what? I went ahead and signed up for a LinkedIn training on budget management and I just completed it. So now I feel like more well-versed. Um, I think that's really helpful. Um, but I would say, you know, the other piece that I don't want to discount is um, what Maher said earlier about just taking a job because you need to pay the bills. Yes, a thousand times. We all know those student loans hit. We need that money. Don't discount volunteering or internships to gain experience. I know we all need money to pay our bills, but in the downtime where you're not working and you're finding it really difficult to get your foot in the door, that experience is invaluable. So if someone's coming to me and saying, I want to be um, a program associate on your global initiatives team, and they have zero experience, but they showed me all of their volunteering experience. Hey, you know, I'm writing a blog post for this organization. I have volunteered at this organization. I'm doing this and that. I actually think that that is more impressive than someone that just looks like a traditional candidate through and through. 
Um, I actually got my break. I, this is going to age me. I came out of college in the midst of a huge crash and had nowhere to go. Didn't know what I was going to do with my life. And so I volunteered through a network. Um, I volunteered for a number of months before I broke into the legal services industry. And it was the best experience of my life because I could answer the question of why don't you have this experience? And I had this list of volunteer and internships experience. If you can't do that, that's okay too. I would say look for ways and synergies maybe with your academic coursework. Um, Cause I love someone that says, you know, maybe I lack practical experience, but in my graduate school, you know, I did this capstone project that really focused on this. If you can make the connection, you can make it work. Also, organizations are looking more and more at personal competencies to be successful in roles. So things like adaptability and resiliency and grit, all that is just as important as your technical competency. So if you can show them that you're scrappy and that you can rise to the ranks and that even if this information is really complex and you have no background, that you're going to throw yourself into it 100% and you're committed, um, I think that goes really far. And so it's about what is your elevator pitch? So that's the other thing that I'll leave before I pass it over to Maher and Andrea is you have so much time before people just glaze over and hit next because we probably have scheduled nine other interviews in the same day. We're looking to backfill. So really rehearse your interview questions, but also that question, what makes you stand out amongst all these candidates? You better have a really good pitch. Um, so tie in some personal you know, stories, right? Um, maybe I don't have experience in the international development sector, but I spent two years, you know, teaching English in South Korea and volunteering in a women's um, shelter there. Hey, that's my story, um, which led me here. So um, I think that's something that I would also say is what's your pitch? Um, and again, don't discount the value of looking at other people's bios on either on LinkedIn or on websites. If they're non-traditional and they didn't necessarily have experience breaking in, that's a good signal to you that the organization is interested, I would say, yeah, that's it. I know we have close on time. Okay, so that seemed like a great answer. So if the other, our other two um, panelists don't mind, I think we'll go right into the um, questions from the audience. Um, So, um, I think there was, was there one about time management in the audience questions? So it's now marked as answered, um, but I'll, I guess I'll read it out aloud just in case anybody is watching the recording and I don't think in the recording you can see the questions. Um, so how should you manage different priorities during a job search and how many applications should you expect to submit? Um, if anyone wants to start. Um, okay, so I'll speak to the second piece before the first one. How many applications should you expect to submit is that's that's a that's an abstract number like that's an imaginary number there's no way of knowing um and thinking about it in my opinion is is problematic inherently to psychological well-being while searching for a job um i've had two major bouts of job searching since graduating undergrad one was a year long and I submitted like a hundred applications throughout, maybe a little more. Um, and then I found something and everything was great. But thinking about how many I applied to and how many I needed to apply to and all of that wasn't really helpful and mostly just caused anxiety. I would suggest reframing that and setting a goal per week. Um, for example, in a week, if you want to apply to two positions, 
and this is another important piece, search for two more positions to apply to or find two more organizations you're interested in or uh, set up an informational interview or my advice is to build a framework that you can work within to be constantly making progress, giving yourself credit for the work you're doing because searching for jobs is a job. So my suggestion would be to set a goal that is ambitious but attainable and will give you an excuse to feel good about yourself at the end of the week, whenever you have to go into another week and search for jobs again. So if that's applying to two jobs, applying to four jobs, whatever is actually manageable for you, it really depends on how many other things you have to juggle. If you have kids, that's an entirely different question, right? You have lots of other things to manage. So I would put my goal at a different point if I were, if I were dealing with that. Um, so it's really about you. It's about understanding what you need to do and how you're going to be able to manage to make it through. Another suggestion I would make, set time each day to do this work. If you're going to do it from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m., do it from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. and leave it after that. Don't do it all day, every day, because one, you're not going to be as productive at 5 p.m. on a Tuesday as you were at 10 a.m., and you're looking for producing quality, not necessarily quantity overall. So quality requires you to be on the ball. So set time and stick to that time because then you have time for other things and you can be okay with doing other things. You're still a person. You still need to be able to relax. You still need to be able to do other things that make you feel good in your life. My second suggestion would be, Outside of looking for work, do other things that make you feel productive. If that's taking a class, for me, it was taking a class. If it's taking a class, if it's writing, if it's um, volunteering is a really, really good one because that's productive and it feels like you're, you're going somewhere with it. My suggestion is to have a second avenue for edification that is not dependent on you. Well, basically, it's not dependent on other people. It's something that you can better yourself with rather than having to rely on the people who are reviewing your applications to be like, wow, this person's amazing, let's interview them because that's outside your control. So my advice would be to have a second, at least one other source that's like, this is good, this is productive, this is going somewhere for yourself. Um, yeah, but those are my two big advice, like piece of advice, set times for this, don't do it outside those times, unless if it's an inter informational interview and you're working with somebody else's schedule, that's a different thing. But if you're actually just solitarily searching for jobs, applying to jobs, set time for that. And then have something else that makes you feel good and productive. And then have a life because you still have to have a life. Great. Um, I think that Edith has marked that she was interested in answering one of the questions. Um, I might just be typing and trying to respond to people, so. Entirely in typing. Um, so are there any others which are unanswered? Um, somebody's asked pip tips on the structure of the elevator pitch. Oh yeah. Um, I don't know if I have time to go through all of it, but if you give me some uh, email addresses, I can send you just an outline for it. Um, you want like a one line kind of memorable thing about yourself, essentially. Um, and then, you know, a lot of it can be taken from your cover letter that hopefully you've tailored. So um, if you want just a script, I can give you a standard and then you should definitely personalize it. Um, I can't stress the value of coming prepared to those interviews. Like I love candidates that are asking me a ton of questions about the work. Um, so when I get through the, the interview and I'm like, what questions do you have for me? If it's crickets, that means you haven't done your homework or not really interested. Um, and some of it just might be nerves. So please practice um, with your friends, with your family. If you don't have anyone that you feel like you can do informational kind of practice interviews with, I will offer myself up. Um, you can always reach out to me um, for tips. I, I am okay about answering email though. Um, I do get busy as well. I, would, I did want to touch on Matt's question about informational interviews going unanswered. Um, I would say if there's a way that you can connect yourself personally to the person that you're reaching out to, 
Um, so a lot of times I use the university connection. Hey, I see we both went to you know Baylor for undergrad. Um, I try to make it a little bit personal um, that way, or I ask for an introduction. So particularly if I'm looking to um, maybe recruit someone and I'm not having a, a great 